Hello, everyone. My name is Dr. David Pugh. I am a staff scientist at the King Abdullah University of Science and Technology's Visualization Core Laboratory. Today, I'm going to talk to you about how to get started with a PyTorch data science project on IBEX. Okay, so the best way to get started with a PyTorch data science project on IBEX is to use the template repository that uh, we have created for you on GitHub. So I'll put the link in the uh, comment section below this uh, video on our YouTube channel. But um, you can visit, uh, if you just put into Google Calst Viz Lab and GitHub, you will probably be taken to our organization page. And at the top of that page, you will find a number of template repositories that are pinned um, to, to the top. So they're easy to find. So today we're gonna be working with the PyTorch GPU data science project. And so I'm going to walk you through how to, how to uh, create a copy of this project um, from this template on GitHub, and then how to clone that copy down onto IVEX. And then we're gonna walk through how to create uh, the Conda environment for PyTorch uh, with GPU support on IVEX. And then I'm gonna walk you through some of the, uh, the, the details of which packages are installed by default into this Conda environment. Okay, so the first thing we wanna do is use this template to create a copy of this repository under your own GitHub account. And so to do that, we click this use this template button. And then under your GitHub account, you can give your, uh, your project a name. So I will just call this awesome PyTorch project. And you can give an optional description so here I'm demoing how to get started with PyTorch on IBEX. You can choose to make the repository public or private. I'll go ahead and make this one public. And you do not need to include all branches from the template repository, just the main branch. So go ahead and then click create repository from template. And this will just take a few seconds. So now that this repository has been created under your, your own uh, GitHub user, we need to clone this repository down to GitHub. And we can do that in a few ways. Uh, the simplest way is to just click uh, the code button and then the clone and then HTTPS link. You can click this button here, which will copy this link to, click to your clipboard. And then once you've logged into IBEX, Let's go ahead and take a look at where we are. So I'm logged into IBEX in my, my user home directory. So I'm actually going to change to the scratch directory on IBEX for my user. And I'm going to go ahead and create this GitHub repository there instead of in my home directory. And we do that by just typing the git clone command and then pasting the URL and we hit enter. And then now um, we can change into this directory. And if we run an ls-l, we'll see that the, uh, the contents of the GitHub repository have now been copied down onto IMAX. So now we're ready to start the process of creating the Conda environment. Now, if you've not created Conda environments before, I would recommend that you check out our, uh, our videos uh, video training on our YouTube channel on how to get started uh, using Conda. Um, if you have not already done so, you also need to install Conda in your IBEX home directory. So there's a video on how to do that. Um, I'll provide the links um, up above in the, um, in the YouTube video so you can have the links to those other videos as well uh, if you need them. So if you run the command which Conda you should see uh, this. So miniconda bin conda from your home directory. So that's what this little tilde here means. So this is the path to the conda that's installed in your home directory. So this is a prerequisite to kind of continuing from this point forward. But once you have conda installed, then we are ready to create the conda environment. And um, so let's talk about how to create the, that conda environment. 
So I've put some instructions in the README um, on how to do that. So the, the first thing we, we should talk about as we're creating the condo environment is whether we need to install the uh, NVIDIA CUDA, uh, CUDA toolkit um, or not. So for this basic PyTorch environment, we don't need to uh, install the, um, do any manual installation of the NVIDIA CUDA toolkit. So in particular, we're not going to need the NVIDIA CUDA compiler. We will not be needing to compile any custom uh, CUDA extensions or anything like that. We will need the CUDA toolkit runtime libraries, but we will get these, as you'll see in a moment, we'll get these from Conda itself. So there's absolutely nothing that we need to do manually. Um, however, if you did need, uh, or you do need the NVCC NVIDIA CUDA compiler for your PyTorch project, um, then you'll need to download it manually yourself um, if you're on your workstation, or if you're on IBAX, then you can do, uh, you can load the appropriate version of CUDA, uh, which will load both the CUDA toolkit runtime and development libraries, including the uh, NVIDIA CUDA compiler. But typically you're not going to need to do that as will be the case today. So instead, we're just going to go straight to building the Conda environment. Now, uh, the way that we do this is we use the standard Conda env create command to create the Conda environment from the environment file that is included in this uh, repository. And I'll go through that in a moment. Uh, once that Conda environment is created, then we're going to uh, activate that environment and then we're going to install a few uh, extensions for uh, JupyterLab, um, in particular, one extension that's going to help us monitor the uh, GPU compute memory utilization, as well as the CPU compute and memory utilization of our jobs in real time. So to do that, we need to um, activate the Conda environment, install these JupyterLab extensions, and then rebuild JupyterLab. And so the commands to do this are all uh, included in this post build script that will that we will source. Now, because these three steps have to be done all all have to be done properly and in a particular order, I've wrapped these commands in a shell script, which I've included in the bin directory. That's this create conda sh this shell script. Now, if you're running this on your workstation, um, just testing it out, you can just run the shell script on your workstation. Everything should should work fine. If you're on an IBEX login node, you could also run this shell script and everything should work fine. But what I found is that the most efficient and consistent way to build common environments on IBEX is actually to launch the environment creation script as a job on the debug partition via Slurm. And the jobs will start fast because they don't require very many, very many resources. Um, they'll also, you don't have to worry if you're connected to IBEX via, via Wi-Fi or something. If your Wi-Fi connection were to drop for a minute, then you might end up with, um, with your Conda environment um, uh, creation process stopping because you lost your Wi-Fi connection in the middle of that process. So you can avoid all of these issues by simply um, using the uh, create Conda environment sbatch script, which I have included in the uh, in the repository. And so that's actually what we're going to do. Okay, and I spotted a little typo here that might be fixed by the time you see this video. Um, but in any case, so now we're going to launch the environment creation process um, as a job on the debug partition via Slurm. And then we're going to talk about what's going on as part of the environment creation. So to do that, from our uh, the root directory of our project, we just type uh, sbatch and then the path to the job creation script. Okay, so whilst that's running now, I'm going to go ahead and, and kind of walk through the different scripts and then walk through the environment creation process. So now that we have that running, uh, make efficient use of time while the job is running. So if we look in the bin directory, um, here is the create conda environment SBAP script. So we, we basically ask for um, two hours of time, two CPUs, eight gigs of memory, and we're going to run on the debug partition. And there's an important constraint here. So we're going to build a conda environment that is um, 
that is targeting Intel CPUs. So in addition to GPU support, we're also going to have the CPU portions of, of uh, or the CPU uh, libraries that we're going to build target Intel CPUs particular, in particular. So we need to add, put this constraint equals Intel just to make sure that we always land on uh, Intel nodes on the Slurm cluster. So this is true. This will be true later when we talk about, um, or in future videos, when we talk about uh, launching uh, PyTorch training jobs, we're also going to need to use this constraint. But then the Slurm, uh, the Slurm job script itself just wraps this um, Conda environment uh, creation script. So let's take a look at that. So in this uh, create Conda environment shell script, we have the, the commands that I discussed that are in the readme file. So we basically uh, set up our environment prefix. So we're going to create our environment in a subdirectory of this project environment, the directory env. And then there is the actual creation of the Conda environment itself. Then we activate that environment. Now, in order to get the Conda activate command to work properly in your scripts on Ibex, you need to make sure that the scripts run as a login shell in bash. So that's why we have this um, bin bash login as the very top line of the script. And then finally, we source this post build script, which just makes sure that the lab extension, Jupyter lab extensions and things are properly installed. And just one other thing, so I want to draw your attention to this handy flag here. So set dash e. So when you have a, a shell script that consists of many lines, the set dash e means that as soon as a single line errors, the whole script will end as an error. So that's not the default behavior of, the sh of a shell script. The default behavior is to continue running one line after the other until all the lines in the script have finished. But typically, and at least in my experience, I found that it's never what I want. I always want my shell script to error immediately if a single command errors. So I always set, have a set dash E uh, line at the top of my shell script. Okay. So just for a second, we'll go over here and we'll use the SQ command to check how our job is going. So you can see it's running. It's been running for about three minutes, running on this particular node in the debug partition of Ibex. OK. So let's talk about the three configuration files for the, uh, for the Conda environment. So first, we have our environment.yaml. And that's where most of the, uh, uh, the dependencies are being installed from. Um, so if you've used Conda before, you will recognize the, the structure of this environment file. Um, I just want to draw your attention in particular to the channels section here. So in the channel section, we have four channels. And this might be more channels than you typically include in your Conda environment files. And I want to explain each of these channels and why the, we have them in a particular order. So the highest priority channel is the PyTorch channel. And that's because we want to make sure that when we install PyTorch and any of the official PyTorch libraries like Torch Vision, Torch Audio, Torch Text, et cetera, that all of these um, libraries are installed from their official sources on the PyTorch channel. Uh, for example, there may be a PyTorch library that is for CPUs only that is targeting uh, Intel's uh, CPUs that's available on the Intel channel. We don't want that version of PyTorch. We definitely want to make sure that we get the GPU version, uh, which actually is also compiled and tuned for Intel uh, Intel CPUs by default. We want to get that from the PyTorch channel. Um, similarly, we want to make sure that the Intel channel has priority over the Conda Forge channel. So the Intel channel is going to have all of the Intel CPU targeted um, versions of the library, most of these libraries that we want to install. We want to make sure that we get those and not the uh, more generic uh, CPU versions, which will be available via Conda Forge. And then finally, we want to make sure that Conda Forge has the priority over the defaults channel because Conda Forge is kind of the largest community repository of, of, uh, of Conda packages. And we want to get most everything from there. And then we will probably get 
very few, if any, packages from the defaults channel, but I always list that last just to be explicit that it is listed last. OK. So I'm going to go through uh, each of these packages uh, in a minute, but I want to kind of skip ahead and, and just mention that the, the, the tie in to the next configuration file, which is the requirements.txt file, which is what's used by pip. So we always install pip in every Python-based Conda environment. Uh, this is very important um, to make sure that when we install packages via pip, they are installed into our Conda environment and not into our, our home directory or somewhere else on our file, on the IBEX file system. So always include pip as a dependency in any of your uh, Python-based Conda environments. And then with this little kind of pip section, we can actually just have conda call out to a requirements.txt file when installing dependencies via pip. So this is kind of a, a handy way to kind of separate things that are going to be installed via conda, which are included in the environment.yaml uh, file, and things which are going to be installed via pip, which are included in the requirements.txt file. So let's take a look at that file now. So in the requirements.txt file, we only have two dependencies. So uh, I'll, I'll mention these in a moment, but you just list them here and that's it. There's nothing, nothing too fancy there. The, the last configuration file is this post build file. And this is where we include some uh, JupyterLab extensions, which we would like to install um, and build so that um, we get uh, support for um, various uh, things within uh, JupyterLab, which will aid our development. OK. Right. So let's go back and check on our Conda environment creation job. Still rolling right along. OK, so now uh, what I'm going to do is walk through each of the, the extra the libraries that are going to be installed within this PyTorch environment. And these are kind of, I'm going to go through these in alphabetical order, although not entirely. Um, so well, let's just get started. So I've included uh, the Bokeh visualization library. So this is a, um, a really nice interactive uh, visualization library that's become kind of a default, um, very widely used uh, lower level library for doing interactive uh, data visualization and analysis. Um, now, I've also included the uh, Pandas Bokeh library. And the Pandas Bokeh library is basically the uh, Pandas backend for Bokeh. So if you're, if you're familiar with using Pandas for data analysis, you'll know that Pandas has a dot plot method for data frames, which allows you to quickly plot um, your data and kind of visualize it and see what's going on. So um, the default backend for plotting in Pandas is matplotlib. So I've installed this pandas bokeh library to allow you to switch the back end to bokeh and plot your uh, and create interactive uh, visualizations using the same dot plot method on your data frames. Okay. The next library is included is the Captain library uh, for um, for PyTorch, which is focused on model interpretability. So um, this is the library that you want to, uh, to learn how to use if you want to gain a greater understanding into why your PyTorch-based deep learning model is um, predicting what it's predicting. It's a way to kind of help understand and interpret the results of your, your PyTorch modeling pipeline. Um, so continuing along, so we have next uh, two more plotting libraries. So we have hollow views which is kind of a higher level uh, uh, plotting API on top of Bokeh. Um, and then we also have uh, HBplot, which is the kind of plotting backend for HoloViews. It's what allows you to um, link uh, Pandas and some of these other uh, data libraries with HoloViews via this dot plot API. Um, there's this PyVis comms library. So this is a utility library that allows, uh, allows you to get support for uh, interactive data visualization widgets within JupyterLab. So it's just kind of one of those things that needs to be there. 
uh, IPy widgets, um, also supporting interactive uh, data visualization and analysis within the you know, Jupyter Notebooks and Jupyter Lab. It's another utility. And then, of course, we're going to install Jupyter. So Jupyter Notebooks and Jupyter Lab is how I do most of my development work, even on IBEX. Um, I'll have a, a follow-on video where I show you how to launch a, um, a uh, Jupyter server with GPU support uh, on IBEX for doing your development work. Um, and then also how to launch batch jobs from within that, uh, that Jupyter Lab environment for your more compute intensive tasks. So a couple of um, additional extensions to support development within JupyterLab. So JupyterLab Git. So this will allow us to have version control support for our notebooks and files from within JupyterLab. Um, JupyterLab LSP, which is a which coding assistance for JupyterLab. So it gives you improved code navigation, hover suggestions, linting, auto completion, uh, renaming, the kinds of things that you would expect. I think there's some examples down here. So like the kinds of things that you would expect from a, uh, a good uh, integrated development environment. So this brings them into the JupyterLab uh, development experience. So very handy. Um, the next JupyterLab extension is definitely, I think, the most important for GPU workloads on IBEX. And that's the, um, the JupyterLab NV dashboard from uh, NVIDIA and the team at Rapids AI. So this uh, GPU or this JupyterLab extension will allow you to build a dashboard like this to monitor the GPU compute utilization and memory utilization out, as well as PCI throughput, uh, CPU and CPU core and memory utilization from within your kind of prototyping workflows within JupyterLab but it also has a standalone web server that you can launch as part of your batch jobs to track performance of those jobs, um, for, of your more compute intensive jobs that you're not doing interactively, but rather launching as batch. So this is, I think, a critical component of any uh, GPU job on IBEX. So next we have matplotlib, standard visualization tool uh, within Python, so that's installed. Numba, so Numba is a library for uh, doing just-in-time compilation of your Python code to target particular uh, CPUs or even GPUs. So this is a great way um, if you have to write a lot of custom code for, uh, for data loading or data pre-processing as part of your, uh, your, pipe, your PyTorch pipeline. So um, you might be able to either write some simple Python functions that then you can use Numba to compile um, to target the CPUs and run them at C, C++ level speeds, but you write the, the function in pure Python, or you might even be able to compile them and target the GPU. Um, it, it, it's very application dependent on what you're doing. Um, but if you find yourself writing a lot of pure Python custom code as part of your PyTorch um, training, then you really ought to look at the number project to see how you might be able to significantly accelerate um, those pure Python functions uh, with just a few lines of code. Uh, finally, NumPy. So NumPy is a core dependency of, of many of the libraries that are included. And I've listed it here just explicitly so that you know that it's there. Uh, Pandas, the library for data analysis in Python is installed. I've included, I've included Panel, which is a uh, dashboarding solution for Python. So it integrates well as part of the kind of PyViz ecosystem, which includes Bokeh and Hall of Views and uh, Data Shader, uh, tools like this, allows you to create dashboards for your data application. PIP, of course, I, I made the pitch on why you need to have PIP installed in all of your content environments already. Um, Apache Arrow. So Apache Arrow is a, um, a Columnar-based in-memory data format that allows you to um, um, more efficiently access your data um, from, in, from uh, within CPU memory for your data uh, analysis pipelines. Um, the idea was that um, Apache Arrow tried, wanted to solve this problem here, where we have all of these data storage formats down here and all of these analytics engines up here. 
And then, you know, depending on how we were storing our data, if we wanted to run in any of these analytics engines, there's a lot of copying and converting between um, internal data formats. And Apache Arrow is basically a common in-memory representation of data that can connect to any of these data storage formats and any of these analytics engines. And um, it's kind of a low-level library. I've included it, uh, I've explicitly included it here because I see a lot of PyTorch training jobs that could be significantly accelerated by storing the entire data set in CPU memory and then uh, and reading batches of the data from CPU memory rather than directly from disk. Um, and so Apache Arrow would be um, a good solution for an in-memory storage format for your data if you want to speed up your PyTorch uh, training jobs. Speaking of PyTorch, of course, we would install PyTorch um, in the light in this Conda environment. Um, I've also included um, so Torch Vision, uh, Torch Text, Torch Audio. Um, these are all included uh, in this uh, in this starter environment. Obviously, if you're doing you know computer vision, then you probably don't need Torch Audio or Torch Text. And similarly, if you're doing you know natural language processing, you probably need Torch Text, but not Torch Vision or Torch Audio. But I've included them all uh, just to kind of show you how, how they're installed. OK, so the next uh, library is called PyTorch Lightning. So PyTorch Lightning is a, um, a higher level API that eliminates a lot of boilerplate, tech, or boilerplate code that I see a lot of users writing. Um, and it's implementing it yourself can be very buggy very repetitive um, and very inefficient. And so I would encourage you, if you're not already using you know, something like PyTorch Lightning, to take a look at it um, and see how it can both um, simplify your uh, PyTorch workflow, but also accelerate it and uh, without giving up the flexibility that you need as a researcher to, uh, to implement various custom components. So definitely take a look at PyTorch Lightning. Um, together with PyTorch uh, Lightning, there's another library which used to be a kind of subcomponent of PyTorch Lightning, but now has been open sourced as a standalone package, um, is Torch Metrics. And so this brings a lot of the um, kind of the standard metrics that many people want to use for all of their various PyTorch based uh, deep learning pipelines, but as an easy to use kind of standalone package. So you don't have to constantly uh, roll your own uh, metrics code um, from PyTorch uh, directly. I've included Optuna. So Optuna is a library for hyperparameter uh, hyper optimization. Um, it can be used not just with PyTorch, but with TensorFlow, Keras, Scikit-Learn, XGBoost, many um, machine learning and deep learning uh, frameworks. Um, there are there are alternatives for hyperparameter optimization out there. Optuna is the one that I have found to be um, be one of the best in terms of both um, support and features and, um, and ease of use. And so I've included it here uh, to help you get started with hyperparameter optimization. Scikit-learn. So uh, Scikit-learn is, I include Scikit-learn in all of my content environments where I'm doing machine learning, whether it's just classical machine learning for which Scikit-learn is kind of the standard approach or even deep learning. And the reason is that um, scikit-learn modeling pipelines offer very useful benchmarks against which you can compare your deep learning solution. So yes, deep learning models are often the ones of, of obtaining state-of-the-art performance according to uh, you know, the various metrics, um, but it comes with the cost. So deep learning pipelines are typically require many, many, much more resources to train there's a high level of uh, complexity in maintaining the uh, deep learning pipelines. And um, so what I have found is that I always want to have a scikit-learn based benchmark solution against which I can compare the improvement that I might get from deep learning. And that allows me to think about the costs and benefits of deep learning relative to, to scikit-learn. So sometimes, you know, really hitting the state of the art 
that you would get from deep learning is not worth the additional cost. And it's good to have scikit-learn so that you can figure out kind of what the relative benefits are. Um, the other is that uh, scikit-learn has great utilities for um, doing uh, model selection and train test splits for data, data pre-processing um, and, and metrics um, that um, you would have to write yourself. And so when you're working with PyTorch, you can you know, just get your PyTorch tensors, convert them to NumPy arrays, and then boom, straight into your uh, scikit-learn your metrics uh, package, or you can use their model selection to do your train test splits you know, on NumPy arrays or pandas data frames, and then convert those to uh, Torch tensors. Um, similarly with pre-processing, all this kind of stuff. So it's important to have scikit-learn. SciPy uh, is a core library dependency for many of these packages, so it's explicitly listed. Uh, TensorBoard, so in addition to being able to monitor your GPU um, compute and memory utilization and your CPU compute and memory utilization, it's important to be able to monitor that your training is actually making progress, that you're actually seeing decreases in your relevant losses and increases in your relevant metrics um, before you launch some long resource intensive training job. And even once you launch this uh, long running resource intensive training job, you should be able to track that your training is actually making progress. Because if it's not, then you're better off killing the job and figuring out what's wrong and starting over than waiting for you know, several days or more for your training to finish only to find out that actually nothing happened. So TensorBoard is, uh, is your kind of solution for doing that. And it's included here by, uh, by default. Okay, uh, weights and biases. So uh, many times you're gonna be running different experiments, different parameter combinations, different data sets on your, your models. Weights and biases is a tool for um, tracking, comparing, and visualizing your machine learning experiments. So it does require that you set up an account with weights and biases. Um, you can get a free account, and then there are some you know, resource restrictions on the amount of, of projects and the amount of experiments and things like that that you can have. Um, and I won't go into that in this video. Um, but then once you have set up an account, you can, um, you can track your your experiments that are running on IBEX, but then exporting the metrics from these experiments that you want to track um, to the to your account on WANDB or weights and biases. Um, and so maybe I'll make a, a training video on how to do that uh, at some point in uh, in the future. But I know that there are many groups here at, at CALS who are already using this and I found it very useful. So I, I thought I would take the time to just go ahead and install it um, in this starter. PyTorch environment. Right. The next um, the the next dependency is uh, Zeus Python. So Zeus Python is an alternative uh, Jupyter kernel for Python. Um, it has some extra features and bells and whistles, and it's just an interesting project. So I thought I would include it uh, include it here. Now, um, let's go and check on our. I have one more thing to touch on, but let's go and check on our Conda job. Okay, so it looks like it's done. So if we do ls-l, we can see that indeed, here's our Conda environment. Looks like it's been created uh, properly. We could um, take a look at the, uh, the error script for our, um, that Slurm created. So here's our job ID. Here's our job ID. So if we look at the error, so the only thing in the error that you see is this is the output from the JupyterLab build. And then if we look in the out, so there's no real errors there. And if we look at out, we can see that, um, so there was some, some downloading of, of packages that needed to take place. Then there was the con environment was created. Some widgets were uh, validated. Uh, the scikit-learn, um, so this is a, a message from the Intel uh, scikit-learn package saying that scikit-learn can even be further accelerated using doll for pi. 
um, and that you need to enable this explicitly with an environment variable. variable. I'll maybe talk about that in a follow on video as well. Uh, and then the pip install. So we installed a couple of requirements via pip and notice that all of the requirements for those two packages were already satisfied because they were installed already in the conda environment. Uh, and then we're done. And it says we can activate uh, this conda environment. So let's do conda activate and then the path to the environment, which is just the relative path dot slash env. And then if we do a conda list, we'll see the contents of this conda environment. So I'll scroll back up to the top. So here we go. So um, you'll see that we have um, several packages from the Intel channel. So these are the packages that were um, are accelerated for and targeting specific uh, Intel CPUs. Um, and let's see what else do I want to point out here? So, right. Okay, so second is the CUDA toolkit. So um, the, the runtime libraries for, uh, for CUDA that PyTorch needs to do uh, GPU acceleration are automatically installed uh, via Conda. So we have the CUDA toolkit version 10.2 uh, from Conda Forge. Um, and then let's go down here and find PyTorch. Um, so here are oh, one other thing before we get to PyTorch. So MKL, so these are in, Intel's math kernel libraries. So these are the accelerated low level um, linear algebra routines. Those are installed and those will be available. So your NumPy and SciPy and kind of any library that uses those will be using the versions of those libraries that are accelerated with MKL. Um, and PyTorch, that's what we're looking for. PyTorch. So we have PyTorch version 1.8, which is the most recent uh, stable version, um, compiled for Python 3.7, CUDA 10.2, and with CUDNN 7.6.5. So you notice that we didn't have to include CUDNN as a, as a dependency to install separately because it's already included uh, with the PyTorch binary. That's different than say with TensorFlow or other um, or, or other deep learning libraries. Um, and I guess you can see here. So the Python version is 3.7 from the Intel channel. So this is a implementation of Python that has been compiled targeting Intel CPUs. And I think that's probably about it. Um, so here are Torch Audio. Uh, Torch text, Torch vision from the iTorch channel and Torch metrics project. Okay. Um, right. So the last thing that I wanted to comment on is um, so the PyTorch ecosystem. So there is an enormous and growing uh, ecosystem of tools that are built on top of PyTorch. I installed very few of them um, intentionally because I didn't want the environment to get too, too large and too generic. Um, and so those of you who, um, who do need um, additional packages, you, know, you should have a look through the ecosystem of tools because there's lots of stuff. Um, in particular, if you're doing computer vision, um, this package, uh, Albumentations, is um, a great uh, image augmentation library for uh, computer vision. Um, and so I want to draw your attention to that. Um, there are, so I did install Captain, um, just to draw some extra attention to that. Uh, so Deep Speed is a library for doing distributed training. So once you, once you go to move on from one GPU to many GPUs, then you need to think about how you're going to do that, um, how you're going to manage the distributed aspects of this training. PyTorch has some built-in primitives for doing that with data parallel, distributed data parallel. Um, my experience is that there are better solutions. Deep Speed is one of them, Horovod is another. Um, and you really want a solution that will scale from not just you know, one to two or one to however many GPUs you have on a single node, but you want, you want to start down 
with a solution that will scale to as many GPUs as you can get your hands on, no matter how many nodes they, uh, they're distributed over. So there'll be some follow-on training videos on how to do uh, distributed deep learning at scale on IBEX efficiently. Um, but as you can see, there are several, uh, several pages of, of uh, libraries here. And I would encourage you to, before you start thinking, oh, I've got to write custom code to, to solve my problem with PyTorch, I would encourage you to have a look through the PyTorch ecosystem and see if there's already a library that is doing most of what you need. Um, you really want to try to minimize the amount of custom code that you're having to write yourself. Even if you think you're doing quite bespoke research applications, um, it's often the case that you can get 90 to 95% of where you need to go uh, using existing libraries. So definitely exhaust all the existing libraries before you think about writing your own custom code. Okay. That's it. Uh, this video has already gone on quite a bit longer than I had uh, had intended, but I've now covered everything from how to get started with a new uh, and PyTorch template project uh, on GitHub, how to clone that project down to IBEX, how to build the Conda environment. And then I went into quite a lot of detail on what was actually included in this uh, getting started with PyTorch uh, Conda environment. So, uh, that's it. That's all for now. Uh, please reach out to us uh, if you have any additional questions or would like any additional content um, on on our YouTube channel about how to get started with uh, with PyTorch on IBEX. Thanks.